Well, Nouriel Roubini says we are closer to a recession uh, than just a few months ago. Roubini is the famed new and what? NYU economist who also runs his own forecasting firm. I'm getting tongue-tied. That rush from the New York Stock Exchange uh, uh, threw me for a loop today, but I'm so excited to be back in studio speaking one-on-one uh, -on -one right now with Nouriel Rabini, who just released his fourth quarter forecast. Uh, and Nouriel, you do say that the risk of recession is now at 60 percent. Uh, what could keep us from that? What can the Fed do at this point? Well, first of all, we have reached a stall speed in the economy, not just the U.S., but also in the Eurozone, the U.K., the most advanced economy. So we see a probability of a 60 percent probability of a recession next year. And uh, unfortunately, we're running out of policy tools. Every country is doing fiscal austerity and there is going to be a fiscal drag. The ability to backstop uh, the banks is now impossible because of political constraints and sovereigns cannot anymore bail out their own distressed banks because they are distressed themselves. Everybody would like a weaker currency, but in equilibrium, if the currency is weaker, the other has to be stronger. And there'll be more monetary easing, more quantitative easing done by the Fed and other central banks, but the credit channel is broken. Most of the extra base money is gone into reserves. So that's not having an effect. A the weakening of the dollar. No, the money. velocity has collapsed, and therefore all the extra base money is hoarded by the banks as excess reserves. And last year, it had an effect in terms of asset reflation, but the asset reflation occurred because the economic numbers in August started to improve even before QE was done. This time around, the macro data are all on the downside. They're negative rather than positive. So, yes, in the last few days, the markets are rallying on expectation that it'll be QE. Three done probably September 21st, but I think there's going to be a short-lived short rally. And with the macro data, ISM, employment, consumption, housing are going to come out worse and worse and worse, the market is going to start to correct again. So we are going towards a recession. We're already at stall speed, yeah. and we are running out of policy rabbits or policy bullets. Well, the hope is, and as you rightly point out, the markets are rallying on the hope of support September 21st at that next two-day Fed meeting. But there's so much speculation as to what kind of policy tool buying in the longer end of the curve, do you see rebalancing of the portfolio? Are there any monetary policy tools that you feel might be more helpful than others? Uh, well, the ones that have been discussed at the FOMC are not going to have much of an effect because no. if you lengthen the maturities, you're buying long-term treasury and selling short-term, you're flattening the yield curve in a way that hurts the banks. If you're reducing the interest rate on excess reserves, then they stabilize the money markets. And that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why the Fed has kept the Fed funds rate above zero. If you buy more treasury securities, two, three hundred billion, last year we did six hundred billion dollar of debt, we did a trillion dollar fiscal stimulus, and we got a growth handle of three percent for one quarter, Q4, and then the first half of the year was one percent growth. This time around, we're not going to have six hundred billion dollar of additional purchase of treasuries, we're not going to have a fiscal stimulus, we're going to have a fiscal drag, and therefore the short-term effect of a rally in the market is going to fizzle out when the real economy is going to go and tank. We're entering a recession based on my numbers. Well, you point out in your forecast, and you just referenced there, the need for some sort of fiscal action. But President Obama out today says he can save one million jobs uh, if Congress does go through as he would like them to in terms of uh, changing some of the uh, infrastructure bills that they have at this point. What can the president, what can Congress do if you don't think Ben Bernanke has the ammunition? Well, we certainly need another fiscal stimulus, much stronger than before. That way, the one we had before was not enough. But the politics is going to imply that Obama is going to suggest another stimulus, more infrastructure spending. But Congress is controlled by the Republicans, and they're going to vote against it under the realm of fiscal austerity. If things get worse, it's only to their political benefit. So but you don't think the first round of stimulus really was all, all that? The Reinvestment Act wasn't effective. Well, it was effective in the sense that we had a great recession, could have turned into another great depression, and every research study, and there is a dozen of them, suggests that things would have been much worse without it. So it was very effective in the sense of preventing another great depression, was not significant enough. Out of the 800 billion, only 98 billion were infrastructure spending. We have infrastructure crumbling in the United States. We have millions of unemployed construction workers. We mm -hmm. need a trillion dollar, five year program just for infrastructure in the United States. It's not politically feasible. That's why there'll be a fiscal drag, and that's why we're going to have a recession. 
So those calls for, say, tax credits for a business to hire someone who's been unemployed for a significant period of time, a payroll tax credit. Beyond infrastructure spending, do you, do you support those measures that the president is expected to endorse? Well, you can have an extension for another year of the payroll tax. That goes only to the employees, not to the employers. Two years ago, I suggested a much broader reduction of payroll tax for both employees and employers. That's not what the president is suggesting. Mm -hmm. Some tax credits are going to have a really marginal effects. Corporates are sitting on $2 trillion of cash right. because of the uncertainty, because of the lack of demand. They're not spending, they're not hiring, they're firing more. But it's perverse. They're saying we're not hiring because there is no final demand. But if you're not firing, you're not hiring, you're firing, then there is no labor income, there is not consumption, there's not final demand. So it's a catch-22 situation in which firms are behaving in a way that actually makes the recession essentially self-fulfilling. We're back in business now with Nouriel Roubini, co-founder and chairman of Roubini Global Economics. Uh, and Nouriel, you're releasing your fourth quarter forecast here. You say we are headed into recession. One of the things that people point out, many Fed governors as well, um, is that when you look at the yield curve right now, historically you see the inversion of a yield curve. It says the recession is on its way. They say this time around you're not seeing it. Why is that the case? Is it the distortion with the purchasing of the Fed uh, of Treasuries, or is, is there something more at work here? Well, you know, traditionally uh, you can have inversion of the yield curve, but right now short rates are already zero, so you cannot have long-term interest rates negative. That's why technically with having policy rates at zero, we cannot have that inversion of the curve. But the bond market as opposed to the stock market now is expecting a recession. We're having a growth scare in spite of the worries that people have about inflation, in spite of the worries about credit risk of the sovereign. The reality was that after the S&P downgrade, mm -hmm. bond yields fell from 20 half percent towards two percent or even below and right now they're barely above two percent so the bond market is telling us a recession is coming and the flattening of the year curve is telling us that we cannot have an inversion because you can have negative long-term interest rates that's the reason why we don't see the inversion yeah, so that's why that model doesn't apply in this case but yeah. talk to me about what's happening in Europe uh, you've spoken about the need to e even go as far as to triple the size of the emergency bailout fund there in Europe overnight we did see in Germany Merkel at least endorse the idea of expanding the German role in that fund. What's enough to stop contagion? Well, not much is going to be enough because uh, once the FSF is passed, they're going to run out of money in a matter of months. And unless you triple the FSF or unless you have euro bonds, then if Italy and Spain lose market access, then there's not going to be enough money to backstop them. Do you so, think Chancellor Merkel will have to reverse her position and endorse euro bonds? Well, politically, Germans is hard because right now the German taxpayer money is backstopping the German debt, right. the debt of Greece, Ireland, and Portugal. If it's going to backstop 3 trillion euros of debt of Italy and Spain, Germany risk losing its AAA status, and politically, her own coalition is very fragile. One of the parties against it, within her own party, there are people against it. So I don't think it's politically feasible to go into the German and tell them you're going to backstop several trillion dollars of debt of the periphery. That's politically is not acceptable. And therefore, if we're not going to have a euro bond, what happened in the case of Greece, a coercive restructuring of the public debt of Greece, it's going to happen not just in an exceptional way, as they said in Greece, it's mm -hmm. going to happen in Portugal, in Ireland, and eventually in Italy and Spain. If you don't have a bailout of the creditors, going to have a billion of the private creditors, like in Greece. That's a likely outcome, unless we have euro bonds. Is there any way to prevent it from, from that debt crisis becoming a true systemic financial crisis? Well, the banks are we in Europe are already in trouble. You know, banking yeah. risk became sovereign risk when the banks were bailed out by the <laughs> sovereigns. But now the sovereign risk is becoming banking risk because you have a bunch of distressed, near insolvent sovereigns who cannot even backstop their own banks. And if I think that sovereign risk becoming banking risk because a good chunk of the government debt is held by the banking system. So there's a vicious circle between the sovereign risk and the banking you risk. You can't separate them. No, you cannot separate them. And the current approach of the Europeans has been muddled through, kick the down the road, go from private debts to public debt to supranational debt, but extend and pretend, pray and delay is not a stable equilibrium, is not even a stable disequilibrium, mm -hmm. it's an unstable disequilibrium. So either the European go in the direction of a greater economic, monetary, fiscal, and eventually political union, or otherwise the only other alternative is a disorderly default or workouts and eventually break up of the monetary union. And neither of those are easy options. Two minutes, we'll have uh, some concluding thoughts here. 
with Ms. Dr. Rubini. Stay with us on In Business. You've actually gone forward uh, with the question, given uh, a gloomy economic outlook, is capitalism doomed? And when you take us on a tour of the world, you're not only worried about Europe and the United States, you're raising concerns as well about China now and its growth prospects. Yes, uh, China in the short run can maintain growth because if there is going to be a severe recession, advanced economies are going to do more monetary, fiscal and credit stimulus. But the reality is that the economy is unbalanced. Fixed investment has gone now to 50% of GDP, infrastructure, real estate, manufacturing capacity. And no country in the world can be so productive. You take every year half of your output, you reinvest into new capital stock. You're not going to have down the line three problems. Massive non-performing loans in the banking system, a surge in your public debt that in China today is already 80% of GDP, including local government. And three, any investment boom ends up into investment bus because you have then misallocation and too many investment projects go wrong. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I see a hard landing in China as a likely event, not this year or next year, but by 2013, when this overinvestment boom is going to go bust. They would be tipped into that by the United States slowing down and Europe slowing down? That's going to worsen it. Even without the slowdown of the U.S., this overinvestment boom is going to go into a bust and a hard landing. If we're going to have weakness in U.S., Europe, and Japan, that's going to accelerate the time at which that weakening of China is going to occur. Now, we have such a global audience. A lot of people are very excited you're coming on the show today. So we had some questions come in via our Facebook page. One of them uh, from Victor Carano, and he says, on China, if you do look at this case of a bursting bubble there, what is the real debt exposure for Chinese banks? Well, if you're looking at the Chinese banks, they have a huge amount of exposure to state and local government, to state-owned enterprises, and to these special purpose vehicles that have done the financing of the local investment has been several trillion dollar yuans. Now, we estimate that about 30% of these loans are going to go into default and becoming non-performing. So the hit is going to be certainly on the Chinese banks. Some of them are going to be backstopped by the local governments. If the local governments cannot do the job, it's going to be the central government. At the end of the day, the banking crisis is going to be losses of some agents of the government, either state-owned bank or provincial government or the central government. And that's why the official debt of China is only 17% of GDP at the central level. But when you add the bank, Mm -hmm. the state and local government and all the other liabilities were already estimating that the public debt of China is 80% of GDP. So you're going to have an NPL problem, you'll have a public debt and deficit problem, and then you're going to have an investment boom going bust problem. And that's why we're going to have a hard landing in China by 2013 at the latest. It sounds like put a nail in the coffin of the decoupling theory uh, as well. Uh, we also have another viewer uh, writing in with a question about Brazil. Um, what are your prospects uh, on the economic development of the BRICS, specifically Brazil, um, and I guess these currency wars that we keep hearing so much about. Well, Brazil has some strong economic fundamentals, but it depends on growth of China, export of raw material, depends on growth of the United States, Europe, and Japan. And therefore, there is not going to be decoupling. Our forecast is that since we're going to have a recession, advanced economies, economic growth in Latin America, including Brazil, is going to slow down sharply next year compared to this year. And Brazil has its own other domestic problem, fiscal deficits, large current account deficit, Some appreciating currency. Bubble credit bubble is becoming eventually excessive. So it's a country that if they do the structural reform that are needed, can have high potential growth. But the question is whether the new president is going to be willing to do those structural reform, the micro reforms that reduce the distortion, that increase the potential growth rate of the country. There may be some political economic constraints to doing that. All right, Nouriel Rubini, so good having this much time with you here on In Business. Uh, thank you for you. coming on the show today. Pleasure.